Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I am sorry. I don't know if you can hear the drilling that's happening um, around me. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming to today's Japan Day program. I'm Allison Wyckoff, and I work in public programs at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge the collective pain, sadness, anger, and frustration felt in the aftermath of another horrific and senseless act of violence against a black man. I honor Jacob Blake and his three sons and his entire family. As a country, we can and must do better. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's Japan Day program and welcome our MC, artistic director, composer, arranger, choreographer, and taiko performer, Melody Takata. I've had the incredible fortune of working with Melody and growing my education of Japanese performing arts through her for over the, the last 17 years. Melody's work is rooted in traditional practices that push the bounds of avant-garde performance. She's founder of Genryu Arts and festival director of Japan Week, a summer cultural festival in Japan in San Francisco's Japantown, of which tonight's program is a part. Melody is a multifaceted artist trained in Japanese classical dance, taiko, and shamisen, and has been performing for over 20 years in Japan and the U.S. Melody grew up in the J Japanese American community of Los Angeles with a rich experience in traditional arts. She started studying Japanese dance at a young age and has performed dance in many venues across the country. Melody has studied shamisen and taiko drumming and has performed as a member of Tokyo's O Edo Sukuroku Taiko, one of Japan's most highly renowned taiko ensembles. Melody is an activist and community organizer working to preserve San Francisco's Japantown through campaigns and programs like today's Japan Day Showcase. With that, I, um, it's my great honor to introduce Melody. Thank you, Allison, and um, thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, normally we have Japan Day out in Peace Plaza, San Francisco, Japantown, um, but unfortunately because of the circumstances, we're doing it online. And we're so honored to be a part of programming with the Asian Art Museum. Um, having known Allison for so long, and it's just uh, a, a deep honor and um, being a part of the community uh, network um, through Asian Art Museum and San Francisco, Japantown, and with our partners uh, out in Chicago, Asia, uh, Asian Improv Arts Midwest. Um, the reason why Japan Day started to begin with is because of uh, in 2007, when Kintetsu was uh, selling a large portion of San Francisco, Japantown, and we felt as an organization a need to support um, Japantown and to um, also embrace our culture, our ethics, and our aesthetics through um, sharing the different artistic practices that we have in Japantown and as I said, in our network, our global network. Um, I'd uh, like to introduce now our our sister city, uh, Taiko Group, Sukasa Taiko and Asian Improv Midwest as um, Tatsuyoki has been a rather, I don't know, I think of him more of as a legend um, as he's been presenting um, one of the finest Taiko and Shamisen um, and just general Japanese art to the community in Chicago and in San Francisco. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Tatsuyoki. Hello, Melody. How are you? And Alison and everybody, thank you um, very much for having me. I'm gonna fix my color here. And uh, there we go. I look much nicer. Um, it's been a long, long time for me to um, uh, collaborate with Melody and Gendu Arts. Um, and I think I talk about this in the um, um, 
uh, other program out of Chicago that uh, Gendu Arts, um, used to be called Gentaiko, uh, has been an inspiration uh, in many ways for our community Taiko endeavor. And uh, we've, um, Melody and I have been collaborating on community level pieces, um, exchange programs and collaborative uh, uh, concerts and events and collaborative recordings. Um, along with, I think, uh, Melody's experimentalism with the Japanese art, we also have some of that uh, uh, collaboration for many, many years. And uh, um, I've been very, very honored to be part of Gendu Arts Cultural Diaspora, uh, which is a Chicago's cultural diaspora today, too. And uh, is Melody coming back on the, on, on the screen with me to, to have a little chat or am I going to go directly into the, the Taiko um, video? Um, we're going to go directly into the video. Okay, great. Um, so uh, Melody and I um, have this um, national organization called uh, Gin Tenkai, which is the group that I used to be in, in the teenager. And, and very interestingly, right around the time that Melody was with Oedo Skirok Taiko, around the same kind of a neighborhood, we had Gin Tenkai. And, and we both shared very, very similar, if not identical, but it's a very similar style of drumming, which is a Skiroku, it's a diagonal uh, Taiko playing, it, which Melody is so good at. <clears throat> and uh, we had uh, several pieces uh, during the same period of time in Tokyo. You know, I was in one end of the town and Melody probably was studying with the Oedo scale of Taiko during that time. So um, Melody brought some of the Oedo scale of pieces to us and, and, and right away we just got, you know, hooked to this. And this piece um, is a national Gintenkai project. So we have some of Melody's drummers from Gendu Arts and some of our advanced uh, uh, people performing together. And this really represents distinctive timing and the style of the Tokyo music, Edo music. And uh, I'm very, very fond of this piece. And this is called the Karami. Enjoy. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Linda Mihara. I am a third generation Japanese American born and raised here in San Francisco. I'm standing in the middle of my family's business, the paper tree. We're called the origami store right here in the heart of Japantown. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I have the pleasure of bringing to you some wonderful origami and um, some wonderful examples that I'd like to share with you right now. We have, you might know paper folding as um, you know some simple things that you might recognize like some cranes or maybe jumping frogs, uh, maybe even some money folds. But it actually has a very rich history uh, in Japan. The word origami is Japanese. That means literally folded paper. Uh, the Japanese are credited with developing origami because of um, the uh, all of the wonderful developments that happened. And the art is about a thousand years old. Um, there's no known records of when origami actually started, but it is something that just developed over time in Japan. So as paper became readily available, um, it was used, it was a sacred commodity in Japan, and it was only used for certain uh, ceremonial purposes. And um, then as it became more readily available to the public, people began to experiment. And origami is one of those things that uh, developed. It was something that uh, mothers would hand down to their kids. And like myself here, even though I was born and raised here in San Francisco, uh, my grandparents actually wrote two of the first books in English on origami. And um, I have them right here. It is, my grandpa's name is Tokinobu Mihara, and my grandma is Hideko Mihara. And these books is volume one and volume two, uh, were the first ones to come out. And what was cool about these books was it had some wonderful folded origami inside so that you can actually unfold it and see what you're actually folding. There was a uh, wonderful instructions and then also some great, a pack of paper to get you started. Their company was called Oriental Culture Book Company and they were the first ones to import packaged origami paper as well as publish these books. So we're gonna move from the traditional crane to really what origami has become now. And that is just, we have some amazing artists that are doing some incredible works. This is called Lescargo. It is by a famous artist, uh, a French artist. His name is uh, Eric Joiselle. This is folded from a single sheet of paper and there are absolutely no cuts. It's really an amazing piece of work here. I also have some beautiful animals. This is one of my favorites. It's a mother gorilla and a baby on the back. So I'm going to turn her so that you could see not only the expression on her face, but you see the baby on the back there is just really a beautiful expression. This is all one sheet of paper. It's an uncut square, really an amazing design uh, for this model. I also have a great tiger that is designed by um, uh, Ta, um, I can't remember his name now, but uh, a Japanese creator. And uh, for this model, he used black uh, paper that's uh, color on one, uh, two sides. So we have black on one side and white on the other. So you can see he uses that to make the design. So the stripes, the detail on the tail, down to the eyes where it's black. So he has to do all that planning when he does his design work. Hideo Komatsu is the name. We also have this fantastic mask. Uh, this is the work of an American artist, um, Joel Cooper. And this is a technique that is relatively new in the world of origami. It's actually called, it's a variation of a tessellation. A tessellation is a repeating series of the same pattern. But what you do is you take a paper uh, and you make these, um, if you look closely, you see these triangles. Um, it's based, you make the uh, vertical folds, horizontal folds, and the diagonals, which is based on a hexagon. Once you have that grid in place, what uh, Joel does is he takes rows and groups of it to make the detail. So while the beard looks like it is cut and then woven, it's actually not. This is one uncut piece of paper. And what's really interesting is what the back looks like. So you can see the paper is actually twisted, and that gives you that wonderful detail of it being woven. 
all the eyes, everything, everything is just folded and there's no cuts. Here's something that I've created. So there's a very old technique in origami, which is folding multiple cranes from a single sheet of paper. Um, after doing that technique for many years, it occurred to me that I can create a three-dimensional shape doing this technique. So it's a way of cutting the paper in a very strategic manner, but not cutting it all the way. So if you imagine a grid of squares, you're cutting the squares, but you're not cutting the joints right at the corners. So there's a little bit of paper holding it together. So this is my piece sphere, and this is 18 cranes, and it is one piece of paper. I'm going to go ahead and show you how I fold a crane as I talk a little bit about um, the history of my family and origami here in San Francisco. So in 1968, when my, my parents started Open Paper Tree, it was uh, it opened in the Japan Center. And um, we had at that time, of course, origami books, paper, we had gifts, a wonderful selection of, of items. And um, then we had the opportunity to buy this property here on Buchanan, which is where I'm standing now. And over those years, in 68, starting in 68, the Japanese community here uh, rallied together to create a festival, which was the Cherry Blossom Festival. They wanted to showcase the arts and culture of Japan. And at that time, my sister and I were, were kids, and they had this great concept during the week to um, have kids teach kids how to do the various arts. So I remember we had some Japanese dancers, and they asked my sister and I to come and teach origami. And so that was our start. So we've been a part of the Cherry Blossom Festival since 68, and it's a joy for us to continue to do so. Um, the crane is perhaps the most recognizable fold in origami, and it is it has become a symbol of peace. There's a famous story about Sadako and the Thousand Cranes, you may know, and it was the story of Sadako Sasaki, who actually became ill during the after the bombing in Hiroshima. And she had heard of the legend that if you fold 1,000 cranes, your wish will be granted. So she wished to recover from her illness and embarked on the, the task of folding a thousand cranes. Now the story goes that she passed away before she actually uh, completed her task. But the real story is that she did complete her task, uh, but that she changed her wish from recovering uh, from the uh, le leukemia to a uh, world peace in hopes that the tragedies of such things as bombing of Hiroshima will never ever happen again. So this is the traditional crane. And the this is what I use for that technique that I used for the sphere. So as you can see here, I've got the paper that's cut along the squares, but it's not cut right at the joints here. So there's still paper connecting all the crane of uh, the squares together. So as you can see, I've started to fold these. Now the trick with this is you have to fold very carefully without tearing the connections. And it does take practice. You do need to know um, how to, of course, fold the crane, but also to be very uh, careful and to not uh, tear that connection there. And uh, this is just a wonderful, wonderful old technique that, um, is I thought I'd like to share with you since uh, everyone's seen the crane um, being folded, but not this technique. So as you can see, you have to be really careful. You have to manipulate the paper in a way that it doesn't tear, almost like you have to kind of fold blindly a little bit because you can't see some areas as you fold. And this is, it does take, take a little bit of patience, a little bit more of focus, if anything. And there's the tail. And we're going to make the head. And then this is how we do 
this connected cranes technique. like this. And uh, I, I enjoy doing this technique. I've, I've torn many in, in trying to perfect this technique, but uh, uh, luckily I, I really enjoy the process. Um, thank you so much for letting me share my love of origami with you. Um, I look forward to seeing um, the rest of the program. And we hope that uh, you have a chance to come and visit me here at Paper Tree and also during the Cherry Blossom Festival, which is another celebration of uh, Japanese arts and culture. And thank you, Melody, for having me. Oh, thank you, Linda. Um, before you go, though, just wanted to see if you can um, elaborate a little bit more about the direction that origami is going. Um, it seems that I, I believe I read that you were doing an exhibit in Taiwan, Taipei. Uh, actually, that was uh, actually uh, two years ago. Um, I partnered with, um, uh, um, I can't think of his name now, I'm so sorry. Uh, but uh, we were uh, asked to come to uh, um, bring this wonderful origami exhibit to Taiwan at the National Museum. And in Taiwan, their knowledge of origami was very limited. So it was a wonderful opportunity for us to bring and showcase what origami can become. And so we had my pieces there, pieces from world famous artists, and it totally blew everybody away. There was one patron that actually paid for tickets for an entire school to come and see it. And everybody was so enthusiastic about that, that they actually ended up making, um, forming a, um, a Taiwan origami group. So, and it continues to this day, which is great. I see, that's really wonderful. Yeah. Can you also talk about some of the work you do um, commercially? So I'm an origami designer and I've had the chance to work on lots of different things. So not only curating origami exhibits, but I've gotten to do commercials for McDonald's, uh, I did a great commercial with uh, Robert Lang um, uh, for Mitsubishi Motors, and we built and folded almost 1,500 components of origami. It was really quite an undertaking. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, I've done some for Febreze. We actually had to fold real toilet paper for this commercial. That was pretty fun. Um, <laughs> and uh, let's see. I've gotten to do... Let's see, clear hair care. I did, uh, yeah, so the, the commercial work was actually kind of fun because um, I find myself being in a position to direct uh, or talk to the directors and tell them what is possible because you can really do anything. And so that was the case on the Mitsubishi commercial where we said, oh yeah, we could do that. We could do this. I could fold the dog. I could fold the Victorian house, which I had to do uh, and um, wow. Do it on the spot and so the d director went crazy for that commercial but uh it's great to be able to educate them and show them what is possible which is really anything is possible so it's great yeah yeah oh that's really wonderful thank you linda for being a part of this and for continuing the legacy of san francisco japantown um and i heard that you're open still or open now and that people yes. can come visit you and buy paper we, yes, we are open um, and we're just closed Tuesday and Wednesday, but we're open, you know, through the weekend. So please come on and uh, visit us and we'd love to have you. That's wonderful. Thank you, Linda. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce the San Francisco Koto group, Hana Ikada, uh, to share their Koto music. And the uh, performers are Shoko Hikage, Chie Chang, and Mamiko Taniguchi. And uh, this group has been performing for Japan Day for at least the last five years, if not longer. Um, I've known Shoko Hikage for quite some time. Um, since my kids were really little, uh, she taught my daughter, Crystal, to play koto. And I really appreciate her virtuosity. Um, and I know she has uh, several recordings as well, CD recordings. So without further, further ado, I'd like to show San Francisco Koto group Hana Ikada.
So that was San Francisco um, Koto Group, Hana Ikada. They also did another piece that um, we are showing as part of the uh, demonstration and lectures that you can check out at www.japanweeksf.com. Um, so please click on there and check out the other piece. It's a very beautiful piece. Um, and I'd uh, like to now introduce uh, the next guest, um, Rochelle Palalam. She's a native San Francisco, um, BA in theater arts with emphasis in scenic design and puppetry. Lum has lived in Japan studying folk art, culture, and theater, theatrical arts in Kabuki and Bunaku. She worked and studied traditional Bunaku and modern puppet construction at Hitomiza Puppet Theater in Kawasaki, Japan, as well as the puppetry style called Kuruma Ningyo in Hachioji, Japan. She also um, has studied Nihon Buyo with Michie Hanayagi Sensei for over 12 years. Lum exhibits her washiningyo at various cultural arts events, such as the San Francisco Sakura Matsuri Festival for the last 30 years. This unique art process of Japanese doll making um, opened the door to expand her capacity to create um, by learning Japanese history and culture through the creation of a single doll. Lum's paper dolls come alive through her simple and concise hand manipulations there is a certain unexplainable beauty of the process in which she does. And I hope you enjoy um, her exhibit that she'll be showing here with of her different dolls and that you would check out our website, japanweeksf.com for her uh, showing you how to make a, a onano, um, a girl doll and a boy doll. Thank you. Washi, Japanese paper, Ningyo Dao. Hello, my name is Rochelle Lum, and welcome to my Washi Ningyo Japanese paper Dao exhibit. This Dao is called Dancer. I got the idea to make her from looking at a book cover on Ukiyo-e. Fleeing Lovers. Or elopement. The boy is carrying a girl on his back and we are running away. I got this idea from looking at a woodblock print by Kiyo Hiro. A plump branch for a girl. The boy climbed the fence to get a plump branch for the girl. This came from a black print by Haru Nobu. Sonozaki Sinju. Double suicide at Sonozaki. Bundaku. When I was in Japan, I saw this puppet show. And when I came to the USA, I saw it again. Since I graduated in theater arts, and specialized in scenic design, it gave me a chance to recreate this tea house scene for my dolls. This is Ohatsu, and this is Tokube. He has just touched her foot to tell her that he is going to commit suicide, and she will, and she will follow him. Sonozaki Senju. Next, we have No. This is from the play Fune Benke. It's where Shizuka is doing a departing dance to Yushisune. No. When I was in Japan, I went to Kamakura to see Apple Sana. This is where an archer sitting on a horse 
had to ride 280 yard long track and hit three targets. Behind him are two photos. The one on the left, I call it storm. And the one on the right, I call it rain. Kabuki, Renji Shi, red and white lion dancer. The white is the father, the red is the son. The father is teaching the son. I like my dolls to have life and movement. These next Dao, I call my, from my creative imagination, it's a lighter side of life. And I like people when they see them, they have laughter. This came from an illustration class I took. I drew this picture and many years later, I decided to make a down from it. And this is my artist. His hair are from fibers I put off of paper and the cat also. Everything you see, the paintbrush, the paint palette, the ruler, the books, the pen, the pencil, the bowl, the paint, everything is are made out of paper except or the plastic triangles. This is my artist. Next was my dog named Michi. Michi loved people and people loved Michi. She was a people dog. So I made a doll to represent her. Here's Michi meeting a new friend. It's a worm, and she's surprised. He has a flower, and he has a happy coat in Geta, and he's also winging at her. All of Michi's fur are from pulled out fibers from paper. If I couldn't find the color for her, I either paint or dye the paper. And if you look real close, you'll see that her kimono has Snoopy on it. This is Michi meeting a new friend. The art of stealing sushi. These are the two dogs I have now. Michizuki, the one in the blue, will steal food off a table when you are not looking. Michiko, the one in the pink, We'll steal food off the table while you are looking. They love sushi and nikiri. But they only get the vegetable parts of sushi. They love sukimono, carrots, and even nattos. The toys are real toys. They make replicas in small size. All of their fur are also pulled from fibers off of paper. Michizuki, I had to put a lot of different colored paper on top of each other in order to create her color and texture. Here's Michizuki, Michiko. Okay. 
and how I put and all the pieces of how I put it together. This is the art of Sealy Sushi. Ibisu is god of wealth and good fortune, often associated with fishermen. He has a fish, but my Ibisu rabbit caught a large carrot. So thank you very much for coming to see my exhibit. For more information on Washi Ningyo, please contact JCCNC, Japanese Cultural and Community Center of Northern California. Ask them about Washi Ningyo and also Tao classes. Thank you for coming and bye-bye. Thanks, Rochelle, for showing your exhibit. I've known Rochelle for over 20 years and watch her develop um, her artistic style um, that she's shown you today. And I didn't realize that she's such a wonderful storyteller as well. So thank you, Rochelle. Um, we're going to be moving on to uh, Ozashiki. But before I talk about that, I also want to just mention, too, that um, Linda Mihara has the paper tree um, location that you saw her um, showing you origami and you can also get washi ningyo paper from there if you're interested in exploring that artistic style of making dolls but be sure to check out our workshops that michelle has made for us on our website um, and uh, before i bring on tatsuyoki i um, or maybe we should be bringing him on now um, but just talking about shamisen shamisen has many different styles. Uh, there is the nagauta, the long song form, which is used for kabuki. Um, there is the hauta, the indoor quiet music, and ninyo, which is the uh, folk music of Japan. Um, and then there's a few more, jiuta and some other ones that um, aren't as well known. Um, but the style that you're gonna be seeing today is ozashiki which is also one of the um, forms that is not normally talked about or shown. Um, and Tatsuyoki is here to kind of discuss with me um, a little bit. So Tatsuyoki, if you can um, talk with me a little bit about the Ozashiki music. Um, how is that different than Minyo and Nagota? Um, is it the same or similar to Hauta, Jiuta, or what can you tell us a little bit about Ozashiki music? Um, can't hear you. No, still can't hear you. Are you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, yes, great. we can hear you now. Thank so, you. Um, so different style of the, the shamisen, as you know, um, even within the kabuki shamisen music, we have nagauta, which is a very um, common, and you studied nagauta a little bit. Then there's a tokiwazu uh, and kiyomoto. And tokiwazu and kiyomoto are usually um, kind of identified as a katarimono, which is a more focused on storytelling aspect of the of the music and the nagauta is 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 a little bit more of the shamisen playing so uh in 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 the play or even in the japanese dance tradition you sometimes you dance nagauta song sometimes you dance tokiwazu song and sometimes you dance kiyomoto song um, and within the geisha music um that are slightly different from that kind of a Nihonbuyo traditional dance or kabuki shamisen music. Um, geisha music also have hauta and kouta in the ozashiki shamisen. And, and a lot of people kind of think they are the same thing, but it's, it's sort of like uh, in the jazz music, you have bebop and hard bop and the swing, and you know, slightly different uh, a style of the music. So 
simply Hauta is the longest one with the geisha singing the song and the kota is the shortest song so the kota songs are usually two to three minutes and the dances are a lot shorter than the Hauta dance and Ozaski Shami saying that where I grew up is is lot longer than Hauta and kota usually because it's mostly uh, instrumental and, and we uh, this is okay. more like a precursor to the main stage of the geisha comes to your room and starts singing kota or hauta so we do this instrumental parts of the party you know for or dinner you know uh and sometimes we sing when party gets really loud and and you know you have to do this dance and singing so so that sort of becomes like a party shamisen music so we do that sometimes and and a lot of times we would just kind of supply this instrumental version of a lot of song and that's the ozashiki shamisen i see um and can you tell me how, when you learned ozashiki um i grew up in the toyoaki moto family so as far as i can remember i had the shamisen and the taiko sound i think the taiko sound that kyoto has the Shime Taiko, uh, and the dancing and the flute and the shamisen was always with me. So I would say I started to play um, Shime Taiko probably about three years old. And, and by five, I had this uh, shorter shamisen that I would play with. And, and uh, you know, of course, I wasn't that good at the age five or six, but I, have, but I had the instrument. So by eight or nine or ten, I was able to perform. With the other people in the in the family. I see. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and what piece will you be playing for us um, today? So I am going to do. Um, I think we we just kind of talked about a little bit the loudy party music a little bit, and and go down to the the other parts of the Ozaki Shemin. And here is um. <laughs> Here's the, the party song, and you're supposed to be um, dancing and singing with it. And this is called Sore Sore. about this is that uh, the singer that sings the song sort of improvise the lyrics depending on what you're saying but we start with the uh, the range so uh, Ura no hatake, the, the, the field in the backyard has the, the, the rain and so za, za, za. then you have the kaze in the, in the nearby so pew 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 then, then thereafter, it always changes. So I heard this song lyrics changing consistently with my grandmothers. Uh, you know, I grew up with a different sets of grandmothers in a different parts of Tokyo. So, you know, uh, that's, that's what's happening uh, in this song. Uh, and now we're gonna yeah. go to a little bit of a, uh, to the core of the Ozaski Shamsen. <laughs> So imagine you are uh, waiting for uh, someone to come in, in your uh, dinner table singing Hauta and Koso Kota. So before then, we would have these kind of uh, Ozaski music. <laughs> Oh. 
So this will be the example of, of one of the prelude to the uh, main star coming into the room. And we're going to end this uh, uh, session um, for another song. So some of you may know that shamisen have different kind of a sets of tuning depending on what song you play. So I just kind of uh, went through three different tuning on this presentation. And uh, Melody, thank you very much. I miss playing with you uh, in the uh, Japan day. Uh, we always do this every year. And uh, unfortunately, um, we have to be remotely connected. But fortunately, we have a chance to talk about this thing. And uh, I'm so happy to be part of this. And here is a, a song called Kirigirisu, and this will be end of the uh, presentation for today. Thank you. This is the example of Toyoaki Moto Shamisen, and we call it Toyoaki Shamisen, but uh, officially our cuisine house was called Toyoaki Moto. And thank you very much. Domo, arigato gozaimashita. Kyou wa no, uchi no chojo no Kyou to Aoki to issho ni ano ensou sase de itadakimashita nde. Mata, ano, San Francisco de oai shimashou. Domo, arigato gozaimashita. Domo, arigato gozaimasu. Thank you, Tatsu, and thank you, Kyoto, for coming out and doing that live for us today. Um, thank you for all our performers. Um, they did such a wonderful job of presenting their work, and I hope you enjoy their artistic um, abilities. Um, I've, I've been enjoying it for the last 15, 20 years, and um, it's so wonderful to be able to present Japan Day to you, um, even though we're not able to do it live. Uh, normally, we have two stages, an outdoor stage, a Peace Plaza, an indoor stage, and the East Mall, as well as um, workshops in the Union Bank uh, community room um, and other workshops that we hold during the week. So in that expansion, um, our goal was to share with the public and to really embrace um, the beauty that uh, Japanese culture has to offer and to really think about our humanity with each other, uh, especially during these times when so much violence and um, is happening. Um, it's, um, it's good to know that there are people and that we all are here to share with each other and to help one another out. Um, as you can see listed, we have lectures and demonstrations still going on till September 13th, so please check them out. Uh, we have a special um, shamisen uh, called uh, the Gidayu. It's a slightly different kind of shamisen um, in construction the, as a whole, as well as how it's used in presenting stories. Um, so please check that one out as well. Um, and if you're in San Francisco, Japan town, definitely go by see Paper Tree. Um, don't forget to buy your stamps. Uh, Ruth Ozawa has some wonderful um, pictures of her artwork on the stamps. And so please support our US Postal Service, as well as our Japantown community um, restaurants. 
uh, they are still open and serving wonderful food. And so please go by. Um, you can order online and pick it up or you can have it delivered. And I believe that uh, you can actually sit outside in the Peace Plaza. They're setting it up so that you can enjoy your meal as soon as you pick it up. So thanks again for coming and thanks to the h and ECM. Let me bring back Allison. Melody, thank you so much for hosting tonight's program. Um, it was great to share space with you and to be a co-presenter here of the, the 2020 Japan Day program. Uh, I echo Melody's thanks to all of our presenters today. Linda, your innovative and imaginative uh, origami work, uh, Tatsu and Kyoko. The Koto Group, Rochelle, your um, whimsical, washi ningyo. Um, I know I was incredibly inspired. And from the chat, uh, I know our audience uh, was too. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Please check the Asian Art Museum website at www.asianart.org <clears throat> for information about upcoming programs and to um, search our collection database for uh, Japanese artworks, as well as our school and teacher resources for um, resources of, and content uh, specific to Japan. Thank you all for joining us today, and I hope you have a, a lovely weekend.